Section 7 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. Why Do We Need a Public Library? Section 7 The Relation of the State to the Public Library by Melville Dewey. This statement of first principles was made by Melville Dewey at the Second International Library Conference, held in London July 13th through 16th, 1897, and is reprinted from the Transactions and Proceedings of the Conference, London, 1898. In reading this address, it must be kept in mind that it was made to Englishmen, whose conception of the functions of a public library were then, as now, much more conservative than ours. A sketch of Dr. Dewey will be found in Volume 1 of this series. We have been listening to an admirable account of the development of the library movement from earliest times to the present day, and I venture to believe that when the history of the age in which we live is written, and is looked back upon by those who shall come after, it will be known distinctively as the library age. Libraries of one sort or another have existed from the beginning of human history, and we are now well into the fifth century since the invention of printing, so that it would seem as if there had been abundant time for library development. But so great an institution as the modern library is of slow growth. It has taken a thousand years to develop our school system from university down to kindergarten. The public library is much more rapidly going through corresponding stages in order to come into its own. The original library was a reservoir, getting in and keeping safely a storehouse for posterity. That was and is a great function, for which I have profound respect. Then, after many centuries, came another library epoch, for which we all feel still greater respect. The cistern was made a fountain. Giving out was seen to be more important than getting in. The library is no longer merely a passive receptacle, but becomes an aggressive educational force in every community. The reservoir will not become a stagnant pool, for in its branches and deliveries the public library has mains and pipes laid through every street, and reaching almost to the door of every householder. And we live now not in the age of the reservoir, but in the age of the fountain. In our zeal and admiration, however, we are apt to forget that there is yet another and even more important stage to reach. In my own city some time ago we spent half a million dollars in providing an ample supply of water but we found that we had really opened convenient communication with the cemetery by water, for the quality of the new and abundant beverage was such that our death rate steadily rose. The burning question became qualitative, not quantitative, and we are now spending our money on efficient filtration. Of course, no library intends to circulate injurious books, but equally no town intends to distribute harmful water. We are concerned more with the results than with the intention. The mortality tables make plain the physical defect, but alas, science has as yet devised no instruments delicate enough to record the greater danger to the individual and the state from poison in the great current, which has come to be a mighty flood of modern reading matter. The most hopeful and perhaps the only practicable method of guarding against this serious danger is through the public library, which must now in the last days of this eventful century recognize the gravity of the new responsibility which it cannot shirk. Before another audience I might dwell at length on what this problem of selection means, but the representative librarians of the world will understand my claim that wonderful as was the development from the cistern to the fountain, its importance is overshadowed by this great question of excluding the pernicious, which I sum up in the word filtration. This is the great problem of the modern library, and its solution must depend largely on the state. It is often said that the modern periodicals and newspapers are our greatest danger, but this, of course, is true only of the sensational and other objectionable types. I yield to none in my high appreciation of what the best kind of newspaper may do in its capacity as the strongest ally of the public library and of the public school. I am confident that early in the next century such journals will be recognized as a distinct part of our educational machinery, but I am equally clear that the worst journals, conducted merely as money-making enterprises, and catering to the worst instead of to the best elements of both society and individuals, are the most potent factors for evil, and the greatest enemy which the ideal librarian has to combat 
in carrying forward his best work. They leave their habitual readers with neither time nor taste for anything above their own low plane. The mind will inevitably rise or fall to the level of its habitual reading, and we apostles and missionaries of the book have no more disheartening outlook than on the readers whose literary atmosphere is limited to the modern sensational newspapers. But the apologists for such reading say that the history of their own times is of more importance to them than any other history. Should they not, therefore, become as familiar as possible with it? But when a man, on account of pressure of business, never looks inside any good book, yet has time to read everything in the newspapers, he is, well, specializing too much in history. How many men and women there are who from year's end to year's end read nothing but the so-called history of their own times, and who can tell you nothing better than which dog won the last fight. It is a good thing to know the history of our own times. So is a pinch of salt a good thing on one's breakfast potato. But it is not necessary to drink a barrel of seawater each morning in order to get it. It is highly desirable that I should know the geology and topography of my own state, but I can learn all that is worth knowing without creeping on hands and knees with nose close to the ground over the barnyards and dump heaps of our commonwealth, under the vain delusion that I am exhaustively studying its geology. We must join this battle squarely. The eternal conflict of good and the best with bad and the worst is on. The librarian must be the librarian militant before he can be the librarian triumphant. At the end of another century, when a conference like this is held, our descendants will look back with wonder to find that we have so long been satisfied to leave the control of the all-pervading, all-influencing newspaper in the hands of people who have behind them no motive better than the almighty dollar. The solution of our difficulties lies in recognition by the state that public libraries are not only good things, but that they are an absolutely necessary part of our educational system. We started with the university, but found that we had to put under it the college. Then we went a step further and had the academy and high school to prepare for the college, the primary and grammar schools to prepare for the high school, and now we have the kindergarten under the primary school. I am not giving a chronology, but simply pointing out that during these centuries educators have constantly been facing the question of adequate provision for meeting completely the public wants. We have at last reached step by step from the university to the nursery, and have provided a series of schools covering the entire field. Yet with all this we have not attained the full system of education that we ought to attain, and every thoughtful person is now asking, what next? Huxley has well said that a system of education which in the early years trains boys and girls to read, and then makes no provision for what they shall read during all the rest of their lives, would be as senseless as to teach our children the expert use of the knife, fork, and spoon, and then make no provision for their daily food. The whole history of education has been a series of broadening conceptions. I can recall no case in which the ideal has narrowed, but step by step we have come to a general recognition that education is for poor as well as rich, for plebeian as well as prince, for black and white, for native and foreigner, for brilliant or backward, for women as well as men, for deaf, dumb, and blind, and all defectives and delinquents who in the old conception were left without the pale. It is almost within our memory that we have come to substantial agreement that the state owes an elementary education to every boy and girl born within its limits, not alone as a right to the child, but as a matter of safety and practical wisdom on the part of the state. And this broader conception is followed closely by a second and still broader one, that every boy and girl is entitled not only to an elementary, but to something also of higher education. I have met no competent student of this subject who dares deny that hereafter the state must recognize that education is not alone for the young, for limited courses, in schools which take all the time of their pupils, but that it must regard adults as well, and not alone for short courses, but all through life, not in our recognized teaching institutions alone, but in that study outside of office or working hours that may be carried on at home. I may sum it up in the one sentence, higher education for adults at home through life. In this home education, which must hereafter be recognized side by side with school education, the library is the great central agent round which study clubs, reading circles, extension teaching, museums, and the other allied agencies must cluster. 
a statesman solicitous for the future welfare of his country will find his most fruitful field in protecting and guiding the reading of the people it is what a man reads that shapes his future which depends not at once upon the rostrum and the pulpit but on the book and the newspaper in education we recognize that the supreme end is the building of character but many of us have never thought clearly how directly this character building rests upon the public library it is reading that begets reflection reflection begets motive motive begets action and action begets habit and habit begets character and who here dares question this that it is not the air nor the water nor yet the roast beef of old england not its history nor traditions nor laws nor geographic location but character that has made the anglo-saxons england and her daughters across the seas the most wonderful people of the earth it is not brawn but brain the dogs and horses might have the physical qualities but it is the mind and soul and those elements of true greatness which can best be instilled into a people through the reading of good and great books that have made a race of which we are justly all so proud one of the wisest of frenchmen said of the franco-prussian war when the needle gun was suggested as the explanation of german victory no it was not the needle gun nor the german soldier who held it nor yet the german schoolmaster who trained the soldier but it was the german university that made the schoolmaster knowledge is power and it is knowledge that has made england and america great think of the men who read the poorest newspaper but know nothing of our best books can the state afford to make other things free and not make free true and useful knowledge as preserved in books can the state recognize the necessity for free schools and fail to provide free access to the best reading in all realms of knowledge free as air was the old time strongest expression then men learned how absolutely essential to physical well-being was abundance of water and our language records in its favorite expression free as water the meaning of the untold millions that civilization has spent to supply all people freely with this essential we are learning the greater lesson about the necessity of free knowledge more slowly because intellectual and spiritual things are not so readily discerned by our mortal eyes and it takes more time to read even those messages that god has written very large for those who have eyes to see but the time is not far distant mark my words when our speech will again record the general acceptance of a great truth in the common phrase as free as knowledge we should make the public understand the relation of the school system to the library system that the library is not merely a collection of books or a storehouse but an aggressive and active source of education side by side with the free schools if the issue came but thank god it never will between giving up either the library or the free school i am not sure that i would not choose for the welfare of the country the public library rather than the school this may sound strange from one who has given his life to education but i believe that even without our schools nearly every boy and girl would somehow learn to read and when i soberly consider the influence on lives and characters and on the state it seems probable that infinitely valuable as is the work of our free schools it would be exceeded by what could be done by a system of free public libraries reaching every boy and girl and man and woman in the community and so administered as to provide each freely from childhood to the grave with the best reading in every field of interest and activity the state whatever it may or may not do should recognize the library as being as essential to public welfare as is the school and it should give it as careful protection from dangers without and within as it gives to institutions like banks and insurance companies the state should protect the library against unjust laws improper interference or pernicious influence of any kind from without it should guard it also against misconduct incapacity or neglect on the part of its trustees officers or employees beside the direct appropriations for its support it should grant the most liberal powers for holding property given by individuals for the public benefit and above all should grant entire exemption from taxation to tax a free public library for doing its beneficent work is theorizing gone mad it is as absurd as for a missionary to refuse admission to his preaching or for the manager of a theatre in which a fire has just started to shut out every fireman till he had presented the conventional coupon for a reserved seat the example first set by my own state new york 
in the statute which I had the honor of drawing, ought to be followed universally. We created a public libraries department to devote its entire attention to advancing the best interests of public libraries. It would take an entire morning to sketch you the various forms of beneficent work which we have found practicable. We help to establish new libraries, reorganize old ones, revise methods, select books, lend single books or entire libraries, grant books or money up to $200 yearly to any library raising an equal sum from local sources, and by means of correspondence, personal inspection, and steady work in a dozen directions, help every community to get the greatest practical good from the labor and money given to its free library. We have now about 500 traveling libraries moving about in all parts of the state. The public library is rapidly becoming universal. For the government not to recognize it in its own organization is as absurd as it would be to have a standing army and no war department, or schools dotted all about the state and no department of education. Time forbids more than the mere naming of what is needed. But the first great step in summing up the relation of the state to public libraries is the establishment of a public libraries department, in charge of a strong man who appreciates the almost limitless opportunities for usefulness which this new field affords. Our discussions this morning took such a turn that you could almost hear behind them, like the recurring motive of one of Wagner's operas, the question, who shall be the greatest among librarians? In our state library school, I give each year a course of five lectures on the qualifications of a librarian, and point out under a half hundred different heads the things we should demand in an ideal librarian. But when we have covered the whole field of scholarship and technical knowledge and training, we must confess that overshadowing all are the qualities of the man. To my thinking, a great librarian must have a clear head, a strong hand, and above all, a great heart. He must have a head as clear as the master in diplomacy, a hand as strong as he who quells the raging mob, or leads great armies on to victory, and a heart as great as he who to save others will, if need be, lay down his life. Such shall be the greatest among librarians, and when I look into the future I am inclined to think that most of the men who will achieve this greatness will be women. It is well to hold up high ideals, but it would be a sad mistake to underrate the services of the noble men and women, who in some, or perhaps many, respects fall far short of the standards we lay down, and yet who have done and are doing well much of the world's best work. Let us dwell on what has been well done, not on what has been omitted or on what might have been done by other men in other circumstances. I remember some twenty-five years ago reading in George Eliot's Romola these words, which we should remember when thinking of any great librarian who of necessity fails in some respects to meet all our ideals. It was the fashion of old when an ox was let out for sacrifice to Jupiter, to chalk the dark spots and give the offering a false show of unblemished whiteness. Let us fling away the chalk and boldly say the victim was spotted but it was not therefore in vain that his mighty heart was laid on the altar of men's highest hopes. End of section 7。section 8 of Why do we need a public library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley Why Do We Need a Public Library? by Various Section 8 Cooperation Between Library and Community by Miss M. Anna Tarbell A paper that originally appeared in the Springfield Republican, December 1, 1899, and was reprinted in Home Education Bulletin No. 31 of the University of the State of New York. The author, Miss M. Anna Tarbell of Brimfield, Massachusetts. The use of the word cooperation in connection with the public library implies that the library is not simply a collection of books, that it is not a passive institution, a repository of treasure, but an active institution reaching out to bestow benefits. The library spirit means not only cooperating with all uplifting forces in the community, but creating and stimulating such forces. The library spirit seeks to carry brightness into gray and toil-worn lives. 
to give broad vision in place of the narrow and distorted view, to awaken generous sympathies and noble thoughts in place of sordid desires and petty interests. Imbued with this spirit, the librarian will be a lover of humankind, sympathetic, earnest, self-sacrificing, a true missionary, enthusiastic withal, and eager to seize upon ways and means by which the library may more and more be made to enrich human life. But however abundant in resources the library, and however zealous and efficient the librarian, there is a limit to the work that can be accomplished on the library side for the promotion of intellectual life and general culture. There needs to be a larger and more intelligent demand on the community side for the supply which the library offers. To stimulate this demand, there is needed the cooperation of those people and those institutions in the community that possess special opportunities for increasing the use and influence of the library, or in any way making human life wiser, better, and happier. This cooperation may be both direct and indirect, since all culture influences are, by nature, cooperative with that of the library. I shall dwell specially on the need of stimulating cooperation on the side of the community, for the reason that the library has already taken the initiative, and because library privileges are so abundant in Massachusetts, so freely offered and eagerly extended, without a proportionate response to these privileges on the part of the public. While dwelling most upon the importance of its educational influences, I would not underrate the province of the library in providing entertainment and recreation, which have their culture value. But the following are impressive words from the editor of the New England magazine in its current number. Education in a democracy is so fundamental that education may almost be looked upon as another way of spelling democracy. We are to consider more carefully the educational function of everything which affects the mind of the people, the church, the newspaper, the library, the platform. Considering cooperation with the library on the part of individuals, we naturally think first of those who are connected with the library by virtue of their office, namely the library trustees. The trustees have special opportunities for increasing the use and usefulness of the library on account of their acquaintance with and influence upon the library on one hand, and their daily intercourse with the public on the other. There has so far come to my notice such assistance by the trustees as inviting people, especially newcomers, to the library, carrying books to outlying schools, personal assistance in the library, and collecting historical material for preservation in the library. It is true that the literal requirements of the Office of Library Trustee are only those of a conservative nature, just as the duties of the librarian were formerly considered to be those of the careful custodian. But as the library spirit gains ground and the conception of the library as an active mission grows, we may look forward to the day when every town will be sure of having six or nine persons, as the case may be, not only engaged in improving the character of the library, but in promoting its increased and more effective use, a standing committee for the cultural interests of the town. This cooperation will be promoted by trustees attending the meetings of library clubs, joining the clubs and assisting them, as well as by giving the librarian every encouragement to do so, such as granting leave of absence and possibly paying expenses. The library journal and public libraries should be on the subscription list of every library, and trustees as well as librarian need to keep informed of progress in the library world. There are other people in every town who would be willing to assist in the work of the library, or help people to get books, or encourage more and better reading, if asked to do so by the librarian. To seek out such persons, then, is the duty and opportunity of the librarian in this work of cooperation. Suggestions regarding volunteer aids in library work are admirably given in the report of the State Library Commission for this year in the bound volume, Public Libraries of Massachusetts, and should be read by librarians and trustees and shown to all patrons of the library who are available for assistance. Surely the home should cooperate with the library by the example of the reading habit, and by the direction of the reading of the children, while it would be an excellent thing for parents to pursue lines of reading that would keep them in touch with the children's studies. As it is, I fear librarians will bear out the recent statement of a school supervisor that the home is not even inclined to supervise the children's reading, and the selection of books being left largely to themselves, 
Many boys and girls read books not proper for them to read. The church, the school, and the library are institutions which naturally constitute a triple alliance. Cooperation between the library and the schools, which has received so much consideration and is being so rapidly developed, I need not dwell upon. But there is a need for increased cooperation between the church and the library. This cooperation should be both direct and indirect. Ministers should feel a responsibility for the intellectual as well as the spiritual welfare of the people. They should show that intelligence and breadth of mind make a better and more efficient Christian, and that the church will become a greater power if its members read and think. The minister has had special privileges for his own culture, and he has peculiar opportunities for recommending books, guiding library taste, and directly increasing the use of the library. There should be some kind of study club connected with every church, and those young people who have finished their school course should be taught their moral obligation to cultivate their God-given mental powers and grow in intelligence and wisdom. To advance the special interests of the church along intellectual lines, the library should be provided with books that will improve Sunday school work, aid in the study of the Bible, and the growth of intelligence on religious subjects. It should be provided with up-to-date histories of Bible times in the light of archaeological discoveries, with works of modern reverent scholarship concerning the Bible, and books which record the development of religious thought. Much excellent study is being done by members of the Women's Missionary Societies. It is very desirable that these women cooperate with the librarian in the selection of standard works revealing conditions in the countries studied. Among organizations, women's clubs have probably done the most to assist library interests. This is especially true in some of the western states, notably in Wisconsin. Literary and other study clubs which prevail in New England are certainly in their nature cooperative with the library, while they might be of more direct assistance to it. The library, of course, should give these societies all possible encouragement and help. The clubs will react favorably on the library in creating a demand for books which will improve the character of the accessions to the library. Where a study club does not exist, the librarian should help to form one. It is possible that there is a tendency to exclusiveness in women's literary clubs. If the number limit keeps out those desirous of joining, or those who need encouragement in literary interest, a branch club for their benefit should be formed. Besides working for their own improvement, the members of study clubs should have a missionary spirit and should feel a responsibility for the intellectual welfare of the town. A woman's literary club is capable of being a strong ally of the public library. The newly developing local history societies and the public library are naturally allied and promise to be of increasing mutual benefit. The library should buy town histories and books needed by the historical society, while the latter will contribute to the library records, maps, and published memorials. Further, the Historical Society, by sustaining lectures in which the principles of colonial development are illustrated by local annals, should develop a perception and interest which will be manifested in a demand for volumes of history now lying dusty on the library shelves. The Grange is another organization whose objects affiliate it with the library, since the Grange movement is an important culture movement. There is opportunity for more active cooperation between the library and the Grange. The Grange and also the Farmers Clubs should be asked to recommend the best works upon agriculture, while the lecturer of the Grange and the committee of the Farmers Clubs should confer in advance with the librarian as to material needed in carrying out their literary programs. More than one other organization might be mentioned which would help the library and be helped by it through increased cooperation, thereby extending the influence of both. It is the sense of obligation and responsibility that needs to grow. The public press is an agency which certainly ought to be a firm ally of the public library, cooperating with it directly and indirectly. Newspapers should be ever ready to give space to any matter that will bring the library to the attention of the public and they should also keep the public informed of progress in library interests. Deeper than this, the press should constantly exemplify and teach culture ideas, the true mission of journalism. The hope of stimulating greater cooperation between the community and the public library seems to me to lie largely in the library club 
or better library association movement first local library clubs should increase in number becoming more truly local thus exerting a stronger influence upon the libraries in the section represented and coming into closer relation with the community the membership should include people who are neither librarians nor trustees but whose sense of responsibility will be awakened as their interest is increased the district represented should not be so large as to prevent meetings being frequently held in the same vicinity these local clubs should be in close relation with the state club or association and the state library commission the local clubs will do the actual close work while having the support advice and assistance of the state club and state commission the local clubs will give information as to conditions and needs and will be agencies for the application of progressive ideas the study of conditions of what may be called the environment of libraries comes with the province of library club work the study of the conditions and needs of the small towns and rural communities is of leading importance from what other source except from the library movement with a greater development of its possibilities is help for those towns to come the initiative in personal effort to give advantages for want of which some of the small towns are suffering has been taken by the women's education association in the loan of their traveling libraries accompanied by personal visits and the study of conditions and needs but there is another want besides that of books in the small villages and towns there is needed not only the printed page but the speaking voice the influence of personality through lectures a story from experience will illustrate this need a few years ago there was held in our town an exhibition of antiquities which awakened intense interest on the part of old and young this interest made a good opportunity for the study of colonial history which a few of us carried on certain books not in our library were needed although the library is a good one and well equipped in american history our want came to the knowledge of miss chandler a chairman of the library committee of the women's education association and out of this grew another year a special library lent to us upon american history which formed a valuable supplement to the works contained in our library in that department at both times when we had the exhibition and when we received the traveling library which we still possess having bought the books i realized the opportunity and need of lectures what a strong combination the group would have made the exhibition the working library and a lecture course this would have been in reality an adaptation of the idea of university extension which i believe could be developed by the library club movement each town would have its standing library committee composed of members of the local library club and several towns in the district represented by the club would form a convenient circuit but if this scheme which i believe to be feasible cannot be immediately developed or applied there should be no delay on the part of those interested in library work in massachusetts in considering some plan of promoting popular education the leading object today of library work through lectures of some kind if not sustained courses having continuity of subject two difficulties meet this need of lectures in the smaller and poorer towns and in many villages that of the expense of securing the best talent and nothing short of excellent ability will serve and that of knowing where to find available speakers the last difficulty can be met by organizing a committee who will search out those who can be secured to speak under the auspices of the libraries of the small towns a plan for bringing the expense within the means of the people of those towns might also be developed one source of help might be found in the increase of the powers of the state library commission in wisconsin the efficiency and powers of the state commission have been extended by the passage of a bill through the legislature increasing the appropriation awarded the commission and adding to its duties the commission is empowered to hold library institutes in various parts of the state and to encourage the growth of study clubs connected with the traveling libraries to carry out the duties of the commission among which is mentioned to aid in building up a better system of popular education the additional sum of thirty five hundred dollars is awarded to the commission why should not massachusetts aid in building up a better system of popular education by helping to provide speakers for the smaller villages and towns where needed thus supplementing and aiding the work of the public libraries it is possible that a beginning could be made through the establishment of library institutes if it should be considered wise to establish library institutes in this state 
as important a feature of them as instruction in library matters would be lectures for the public on literary and educational subjects of a popular nature the first step to be taken is for a committee representing the three existing library clubs and the massachusetts library commission to consider what plans are most feasible not only for the improvement of library work but also for increasing the intelligent and effective use of the library by creating new ideals of popular education in the community and thus bring about cooperation in its deepest sense end of section eight section nine of why do we need a public library this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2017. Why do we need a public library? By various. Section 9. The Reformed Library Keeper, or Two Copies of Letters Concerning the Place and Office of a Library Keeper, by John Dury. The First Letter. The library keeper's place and office in most countries, as most other places and offices both in churches and universities, are looked upon as places of profit and gain, and so accordingly sought after and valued in that regard, and not in regard of the service which is to be done by them unto the commonwealth of Israel for the advancement of piety and learning. For the most part, men look after the maintenance and livelihood settled upon their places more than upon the end and usefulness of their employments they seek themselves and not the public therein and so they subordinate all the advantages of their places to purchase mainly two things thereby that is an easy subsistence and some credit in comparison of others nor is the last much regarded if the first may be had except it be in cases of strife and debate wherein men are overheated for then indeed some will stand upon the point of honour to the hazard of their temporal profits but to speak in particular of library keepers in most universities that i know nay indeed in all their places are but mercenary and their employment of little or no use further than to look to the books committed to their custody that they may not be lost or embezzled by those that use them and this is all i have been informed that in oxford where the most famous library now extent among protestant christians is kept the settled maintenance of the library keeper is not above fifty or sixty pound per annum but that it is accidentally vis and modis sometimes worth a hundred pound what the accidents are and the ways by which they come i have not been curious to search after but i have thought that if the proper employments of library keepers were taken into consideration as they are or may be made useful to the advancement of learning and were ordered and maintained proportionally to the ends which ought to be intended thereby they would be of exceeding great use to all sorts of scholars and have an universal influence upon all the parts of learning to produce and propagate the same unto perfection for if library keepers did understand themselves in the nature of their work and would make themselves as they ought to be useful in their places in a public way they ought to become agents for the advancement of universal learning and to this effect i could wish that their places might not be made as everywhere they are mercenary but rather honorary and that with the competent allowance of two hundred pounds a year some employments should be put upon them further than a bare keeping of the books it is true that a fair library is not only an ornament and credit to the place where it is but a useful commodity by itself to the public yet in effect it is no more than a dead body as now it is constituted in comparison of what it might be if it were animated with a public spirit to keep and use it and ordered as it might be for public service for if such an allowance were settled upon the employment as might maintain a man of parts and generous thoughts 
then a condition might be annexed to the bestowing of the place that none should be called thereunto but such as had approved themselves zealous and profitable in some public ways of learning to advance the same or that should be bound to certain tasks to be prosecuted towards that end whereof a list might be made and the way to try their abilities in prosecuting the same should be described least in after times unprofitable men creep into the place to frustrate the public of the benefit intended by the donors towards posterity the proper charge then of the honorary library keeper in a university should be thought upon and the end of that employment in my conception is to keep the public stock of learning which is in books and manuscripts to increase it and to propose it to others in the way which may be most useful unto all his work then is to be a factor and trader for helps of learning and a treasurer to keep them and a dispenser to apply them to use or to see them well used or at least not abused and to do all this first a catalogue of the treasury committed unto his charge is to be made that is all the books and manuscripts according to the titles whereunto they belong are to be ranked in an order most easy and obvious to be found which i think is that of sciences and languages when first all the books are divided into their subjectam materiam whereof they treat and then every kind of matter is subdivided into their several languages and as the catalogue should be so made that it may always be augmented as the stock doth increase so the place in the library must be left open for the increase of the number of books in their proper seats and in the printed catalogue a reference is to be made to the place where the books are to be found in their shelves or repositories when the stock is thus known and fitted to be exposed to the view of the learned world then the way of trading with it both at home and abroad is to be laid to heart both for the increase of the stock and for the improvement of it to use for the increase of the stock both at home and abroad correspondency should be held with those that are eminent in every science to trade with them for their profit that what they want and we have they may receive upon condition that what they have and we want they should impart in that faculty where their eminency does lie as for such as are at home eminent in any kind because they may come by native right to have use of the library treasure they are to be treated withal in another way that is that the things which are gained from abroad which as yet are not made common and put to public use should be promised and imparted to them for the increase of their private stock of knowledge to the end that what they have peculiar may also be given in for a requital so that the particularies of gifts at home and abroad are to meet as in a centre in the hand of the library keeper and he is to trade with the one by the other to cause them to multiply the public stock whereof he is a treasurer and factor thus he should trade with those that are at home and abroad out of the university and with those that are within the university he should have acquaintance to know all that are of any parts and how their vein of learning doth lie to supply helps unto them in their faculties from without and from within the nation to put them upon the keeping of correspondency with men of their own strain for the beating out of matters not yet elaborated in sciences so that they may be as his assistants and subordinate factors in his trade and in their own for gaining of knowledge now because in all public agencies it is fit that some inspection should be had over those that are entrusted therewith therefore in this factory and trade for the increase of learning some tie should be upon those library keepers to oblige them to carefulness i would then upon this account have an order made that once in the year the library keeper should be bound to give an account of his trading and of his profit in his trade as in all humane trades factors ought and used to do to their principals at least once a year and to this effect i would have it ordered that the chief doctors of each faculty of the university should meet at a convenient time in a week of the year to receive the accounts of his trading 
that he may show them wherein the stock of learning hath been increased for that year's space and then he is to produce the particulars which he had gained from abroad and lay them before them all that every one in his own faculty may declare in the presence of others that which he thinketh fit to be added to the public stock and made common by the catalogue of additionals which every year within the universities is to be published in writing within the library itself and every three years or sooner as the number of additionals may be great or later if it be small to be put in print and made common to those that are abroad and at this giving up of the accounts as the doctors are to declare what they think worthy to be added to the common stock of learning each in their faculty so i would have them see what the charges and pains are whereat the library keeper hath been that for his encouragement the extraordinary expenses in correspondencies and transcriptions for the public good may be allowed him out of some revenues which should be set apart to that effect and deposed of according to their joint content and judgment in that matter here then he should be bound to show them the lists of his correspondence the letters from them in answer to his and the reckoning of his extraordinary expense should be allowed him in that which he is indebted or hath freely laid out to procure rarities into the stock of learning and because i understand that all the book printers or stationers of the commonwealth are bound of every book which is printed to send a copy into the university library and it is impossible for one man to read all the books in all faculties to judge of them what worth there is in them nor hath every one ability to judge of all the kind of sciences what every author doth handle and how sufficiently therefore i would have at this time of giving accounts the library keeper also bound to produce the catalogue of all the books sent unto the university's library by the stationers that printed them to the end that every one of the doctors in their own faculties should declare whether or no they should be added and where they should be placed in the catalogue of additionals for i do not think that all books and treaties which in this age are printed in all kinds should be inserted into the catalogue and added to the stock of the library discretion must be used and confusion avoided and a course taken to distinguish that which is profitable from that which is useless and according to the verdict of that society the usefulness of books for the public is to be determined yet because there is seldom any books wherein there is not something useful and books freely given are not to be cast away but may be kept therefore i would have a peculiar place appointed for such books as shall be laid aside to keep them in and a catalogue of their titles made alphabetically in reference to the author's name with a note of distinction to show the signs to which they are to be referred these thoughts come thus suddenly into my head which in due time may be more fully described if need be chiefly if upon the ground of this account some competency should be found out and allowed to maintain such charges as will be requisite towards the advancement of the public good of learning after this manner the second letter sir in my last i gave you some incident thoughts concerning the improvement of an honorary library keeper's place to show the true end and use thereof and how the keepers thereof should be regulated in the trade which he is to drive for the advancement of learning and encouraged by a competent maintenance and supported in extraordinary expenses for the same now i wish that some men of public spirits and lovers of learning might be made acquainted with the action upon such grounds as were then briefly suggested who knows but that in time something might be offered to the trustees of the nation with better conceptions than these i have suggested for if it be considered that amongst many eminencies of this nation the library of oxford is one of the most considerable for the advancement of learning if rightly improved and traded withal for the good of scholars at home and abroad if this i say be rightly considered and represented to the public reformers of this age that by this means this nation as in other things so especially for piety and learning and by the advancement of both 
may now be made more glorious than any other in the world no doubt such as in the parliament know the worth of learning will not be averse from further overtures which may be made towards this purpose what a great stir hath been heretofore about the eminency of the library of heidelberg but what use was made of it it was engrossed into the hands of a few till it became a prey unto the enemies of the truth if the library keeper had been a man that would have traded with it for the increase of true learning it might have been preserved unto this day in all the rarities thereof not so much by the shuttings up of the multitude of books and the rareness thereof for antiquity as by the understandings of men and their proficiency to improve and dilate knowledge upon the grounds which he might have suggested unto others of parts and so the library rarities would not only have been preserved in the spirits of man but have fructified abundantly therein unto this day whereas they are now lost because they were but a talent digged in the ground and as they that had the keeping of that library made it an idol to be respected and worshipped for a rarity by an implicit faith without any benefit to those who did esteem of it afar off so it was just with god that it should fall into the hands of those that in all things follow an idolatrous way to blind men which shows without all reality of substantial virtue which is one the eminent in this that it becometh profitable unto all by dilating the light of knowledge and the love of grace and goodness in the hearts of all men that are fit to receive the one and the other and where this aim is not in those that are entrusted with public places there they in the end will be found unprofitable servants for the trust which god hath put into their hands to profit with all they discharge not for the account which every one is to give unto him of his stewardship it is not how careful he hath kept things of use unto himself to pride himself in the possession of that which others have not as the custom of men is that know not what true glory is but how faithfully and diligently he hath distributed the same to such as were worthy thereof for their good that they might be stirred up both to glorify god for his goodness and to imitate him in the communication of all good things unto others for his sake freely this was christ's work on earth to receive us unto the glory of god this was that which he taught by his practice that it is more blessed to give than to receive this is that which this envious world cannot relish and what stops the current of true love in the hearts of men nothing so much as the self-seeking of men in the ways of learning by which they covetously obstruct the fountains of life and comfort which might overflow and water abundantly the barren and thirsty souls of those that perish for want of address unto wisdom which in all the ways of humane and divine learning might be mainly advanced by the industry of one man in such a place whose trade should be such as i formerly described to deal with the spirits of all men of parts to set them a-working one by and toward another upon the subjects which he should be entrusted with all to keep in the stock of learning it is the glory and riches of nations and of great cities to make themselves the centre of trade for all their neighbours and if they can find ways of policy to oblige their neighbours to receive from their magazines the commodities whereof they stand in need it is every way a great benefit unto the state so it may be in matters of learning and by the trade of sciences this church may oblige all the neighbour churches and that university all foreigners that trade in knowledge to receive precious commodities whereof they stand in need from our magazines and storehouses if a painful steward and dispenser thereof be employed and maintained to use industry for so blessed a work from whence much glory to god in the gospel and honour will redound to the nation for although the ways of humane learning are almost infinite and wonderfully various and have their peculiar uses in the outward life of man for which most men affect them yet in one that is to mind the universal good of all the whole variety and diversity of matters useful unto this present life as they come within the sphere of learning must be reduced and may be subordinate unto the advancement of the gospel of christ wherein the glory of the nation 
at this and all times should be thought to stand and truly that is the thing which takes most with me for which i would have that library thus improved by a faithful keeper that when his trade is set on foot with all those that are of eminent parts in their several faculties we knowing who they are and wherein their eminences do lie may have opportunities to provoke them to the right use thereof by giving them objects from our store and furnishing them with tasks and matters to be elaborated which cannot be diverted from the scope of god's glory to be made known unto all men in jesus christ for there is nothing of knowledge in the mind of man which may not be conveniently referred to the virtues of god in christ whereby the human nature is to be exalted to that dignity whereunto he hath received it that it should by him rule over the whole creation and the want of this aim to look upon things in order to him and to set them a-working without relation to him is that which blasts all our endeavours and makes them determine in confusion and disorder for whatsoever is not directed in its own place with some reference unto him must be overthrown nor is there any way left for any to prosper in that which he undertaketh but to learn to know him and respect him in it for the advancement of the kingdom over the souls of men which by the sanctified use of all knowledge is chiefly effected if then the trade of learning is to be set afoot in a public way and regulated to deserve the countenance of a religious state this aim and the way of prosecuting of it must be intended and beaten out for except sciences be reformed in order to this scope the increase of knowledge will increase nothing but strife pride and confusion from whence our sorrows will be multiplied and propagated unto posterity but if he who is to be entrusted with the managing of this trade be addressed in the way which leadeth unto this aim without partiality his negotiation will be a blessing unto this age and to posterity i have no time to enlarge upon this subject or to conceive a formal and regular discourse but the thoughts which thus fall into my mind i impart unto you that you may give them as hints unto others who of themselves will be able to enlarge them either to the house or to such as can in due time sway the counsels of leading men in this commonwealth End of section nine. Section ten of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schampf. Why Do We Need a Public Library? By Various. Section ten libraries in the medieval and renaissance periods by j w clark a library may be considered from two very different points of view as a workshop or as a museum the former commends itself to the practical turn of mind characteristic of the present day common sense urges that mechanical ingenuity which has done so much in other directions should be employed in making the acquisition of knowledge less cumbrous and less tedious that as we travel by steam so we should also read by steam and be helped in our studies by the varied resources of modern invention there lies on my table at this present moment a handbook of library appliances in which fifty-three closely printed pages are devoted to this interesting subject with illustrations of various contrivances by which the working of a large library is to be facilitated and brought up to date in fact from this point of view a library may be described as a gigantic mincing machine into which the labors of the past are flung to be turned out again in a slightly altered form as the literature of the present if on the other hand a library be regarded as a museum and i use the word in its original sense as a temple or haunt of the muses very different ideas are evoked such a place is as useful as the other every facility for study is given but what i may call the personal element as affecting the treasures there assembled is brought prominently forward the development of printing as the result of individual effort the art of bookbinding as practised by different persons in different countries 
the history of the books themselves the libraries in which they have found a home the hands that have turned their pages are there taken note of modern literature is fully represented but the men of past days are not thrust out of sight their footsteps seem to linger in the rooms where once they walked their shades seem to protect the books they once handled what browning felt about frescoes may be applied mutatis mutandis to books in such an asylum as i am trying to portray wherever a fresco peels and drops wherever an outline weakens and wanes till the latest life in the painting stops stands one whom each fainter pulse tick pains one wishful each scrap should clutch the brick each tinge not wholly escape the plaster a lion who dies of an ass's kick the wronged great soul of an ancient master it may safely be asserted that at no time has a love of reading a desire to be fairly well informed on all sorts of subjects been so widely diffused as at the present day as a necessary consequence of this the workshop view of a library has been very generally accepted i have no wish to undervalue it i only plead for the recognition of another sentiment which may at times be overlaid by the pressure of daily avocations in cambridge at least there is no fear that it should ever be obliterated altogether for we have effected a happy alliance between the present and the past by which neither is neglected neither is unduly prominent this being the case it has occurred to me that i may be so fortunate as to interest a cambridge audience while i set before them some of the results at which i have arrived in investigating the position the arrangement and the fittings of libraries in the medieval and renaissance periods it will of course be impossible to attempt more than a sketch of so extensive a subject and i fear that i must omit the contents of the bookcases altogether but i shall hope by a selection of typical illustrations to make you realize what some of the libraries monastic public or private that fall within my period were like i must begin with a few words about roman libraries because their methods influence the middle ages and are in fact the precursors of those in fashion in our own times the romans preserved their books in two ways either in a small room or closet for reading elsewhere or in a large apartment fitted up with greater or lesser splendor according to the taste or the means of the possessor in which the books were doubtless studied as in a modern library an instructive example of the former class was one of the first discoveries at herculaneum in seventeen fifty four it was a very small room so small in fact that a man who stood with his arms extended in the centre of it could almost touch the walls on either side yet seventeen hundred rolls were found in it these were kept in wooden presses or maria which stood against the walls like a modern bookcase besides these a rectangular case occupied the central space with only a narrow passage to the right and left between it and the wall cases these cases were about a man's height and had been numbered it may be concluded from this that a catalogue of the books had once existed in larger libraries the books were kept in similar presses but they were ornamented with the busts or pictures of illustrious men under each of which was a suitable inscription usually in verse no ancient figure of one of these book presses has been preserved so far as i have been able to ascertain but as furniture is apt to retain its original forms with but little variation for a very long period a representation of a press containing the four gospels which occurs among the mosaics in the mausoleum of the empress gala placidia at ravenna though it could not have been executed before the middle of the fifth century may be taken as a fairly accurate picture of the book presses of an earlier age it is unnecessary to describe it for it is exactly like a still later example which i am about to show you this picture occurs at the beginning of the manuscript of the vulgate called the codex amiatinus which is now proved to have been written in england at wearmouth or gerrow but probably by an italian scribe shortly before seven sixteen the seated figure represents ezra writing the law to get an idea of one of the larger roman libraries in ancient times we cannot do better than to turn to that of the vatican at the present day 
it was fitted up as we see it now with presses busts and antique vases by pope sixtus five in fifteen eighty eight it is therefore at best only a modern antique but arranged so skilfully that an ancient roman if he could come to life again might imagine himself in his own library the library era as we may call it of the christian world began with the publication of the rule of saint benedict early in the sixth century but just as that rule emphasized and arranged on the lines of an ordered system observances which had long been practiced by isolated congregations or individuals living in solitude so the part of it which deals with study was evidently no new thing saint benedict did not invent literature or libraries he only lent the sanction of his name to the study of the one and the formation of the other that libraries existed before his period is proved by allusions to them in the fathers and other early writers but as those allusions are general and say nothing from which either their size or their arrangement can be inferred i shall dismiss them in very few sentences the earliest is said to have been the collection got together at jerusalem by bishop alexander at the beginning of the third century another was founded about fifty years later at kisaria by oregon this is described as not only extensive but remarkable for the importance of the manuscripts it contained others are recorded at hippo at Cirta, at constantinople and at rome where both st peter's and the lateran had their special collections of books i suspect that all these libraries were in connection with churches possibly actually within their walls at Cirta, for example it is recorded that during the persecution of three o three to three o four the officers went to the church where the christians used to assemble and spoiled it of chalices and lamps etc but when they came to the library bibliothecum the presses armaria there were found empty this language seems to imply that the sacred vessels and the books were in different parts of the same building the instructions again of the dying augustine who bequeathed his library to the church at hippo led to the same conclusion the library of st peter's at rome though added to the basilica erected by constantine long after its primitive foundation was on the ground floor in the angle between the nave and the north limb of the transept a position which may perhaps have been selected in accordance with early usage i now pass to the treatment of books in the libraries of the monastic orders these either adopted the rule of st benedict or based their own rule upon its provisions it will therefore be desirable to examine what he said on the subject of study and i will translate a few lines from the forty-eighth chapter of his rule of daily manual labor idleness is the enemy of the soul hence brethren ought at certain seasons to occupy themselves with manual labor and again at certain hours with holy reading between easter and the calends of october let them apply themselves to reading from the fourth hour till near the sixth hour after the sixth hour when they rise from table let them rest on their beds in complete silence or if any one should wish to read to himself let him do so in such a way as not to disturb any one else from the calends of october to the beginning of lent let them apply themselves to reading until the second hour during lent let them apply themselves to reading from morning until the end of the third hour and in these days of lent let them receive a book apiece from the library and read it straight through these books are to be given out at the beginning of lent it is important that one or two seniors should be appointed to go round the monastery at the hours when brethren are engaged in reading in case some ill-conditioned brother should be giving himself up to sloth or idle talk instead of reading steadily so that not only is he useless to himself but incites others to do wrong behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth these simple words uttered by one who in power of far-reaching influence has had no equal gave an impulse to study in the ages it once was the fashion to call dark which grew with the growth of the order till whenever a benedictine house arose or a monastery of any one of the orders which were but offshoots of the benedictine tree books were multiplied and a library came into being small indeed at first but increasing year by year 
till the wealthier houses had gathered together a collection of books that would do credit to a modern university it is very interesting to notice as order after order was founded a steady development of feeling with regard to books and an ever-increasing care for their safekeeping st benedict had contented himself with general directions for study the cluniacs prescribed the selection of a special officer to take charge of the books with an annual audit of them and the assignment of a single volume to each brother the carthusians and the cistercians provide for the loan of books to extraneous persons under certain conditions a provision which the benedictines in their turn adopted further by the time the cluniac customs were drawn up in the form in which they have come down to us it is evident that the number of books exceeded the number of brethren for both in them and in the statutes which lanfranc promulgated for the use of the english benedictines in ten seventy the keeper of the books is directed to bring all the books of the house into chapter after which the brethren one by one are to bring in the books they had borrowed on the same day in the previous year some of the formal class of books were probably service books but after this deduction has been made we may fairly conclude that by the end of the eleventh century benedictine houses possessed two sets of books one those that were distributed among the brethren two those which were kept in some safe place probably the church as part of the valuables of the house or to adopt modern phrases they had a lending library and a library of reference the augustinians go a step further than the benedictines and the orders derived from them for they prescribe the kind of press in which the books are to be kept both they and the premonstratensians permit their books to be lent on the receipt of a pledge of sufficient value lastly the friars though they were established on the principle of holding no possessions of any kind soon found that books were indispensable that in the words of a norman bishop claustrum sine armario castrum sine armamentario so by a strange irony it came to pass that their libraries excelled those of most other orders as richard de Bury testifies in the philo biblon whenever we turn aside to the cities and places where the medicants had their convents we found heaped up amidst the utmost poverty the utmost riches of wisdom these men are as ants ever preparing their meat in the summer and ingenious bees continually fabricating cells of honey and to pay due regard to truth although they lately at the eleventh hour have entered the lord's vineyard they have added more in this brief hour to the stock of the sacred books than all the other vine dressers following in the footsteps of paul the last to be called but the first in preaching who spread the gospel of christ more widely than all the others it might have been expected from the use of the word library in the rule of saint benedict that a special room assigned to books would have been one of the primitive component parts of every benedictine house this however is not the case such a room does usually occur in these houses but it will be found on examination that it was added to some previously existing structure in the fourteenth or fifteenth century its absence from the primitive plan brings out two points very clearly one how few books even a wealthy community could afford to possess for several centuries after the foundation of the order two how strictly the order adhered to prescribed arrangements in laying out its houses for even those built or rebuilt after books had become plentiful do not admit a library as an indispensable item in their ground plan how then did they bestow their books after they had become too numerous to be kept in the church the answer to this question is a very curious one when we consider what our climate is and indeed what the climate of the whole of europe is during the winter months the centre of the monastic life was the cloister brethren were not allowed to congregate in any other part of the conventual buildings except when they went into the freighter or dining hall for their meals or at certain hours in certain seasons into the warming house calefactorium in the cloister accordingly they kept their books and there they sat and studied or conducted the schooling of the novices and choir boys in winter and summer alike such a locality as this could not have been very favorable to the preservation of the books themselves they however had a certain amount of protection which was denied to their readers for they were shut up in presses 
the word used for these armarium is the same as that which was applied by the romans to their bookcases and probably the idea of such a piece of furniture was due to the far-off echo of ancient usage the official who had charge of the books did not derive his name from them as in modern times but from the presses which contained them for he was uniformly styled armarius as time went on greater comfort was introduced the windows of the walk of the cloister where the presses stood usually the walk next the church were glazed and sometimes not merely with white glass but with mottoes alluding to the authors whose works were near at hand while in some monasteries the elder monks were provided with small wooden studies called carols a description of the whole system has been preserved for us in that curious book the rites of durham but it must be remembered that this represents the customs of the convent just before the suppression and therefore gives no idea of the rigour of an earlier time in the north side of the cloister from the corner over against the church door to the corner over against the dorter door was all finely glazed from the height to the sole within a little of the ground into the cloister garth and in every window three pews or carols which every one of the old monks had his carol several by himself that when they had dined they did resort to that place of cloister and there studied upon their books every one in his carol all the afternoon unto even song time this was their exercise every day all their pews or carols was all finely wainscoted and very close all but the forepart which had carved work that gave light in at their carol doors of wainscot and in every carol was a desk to lie their books on and the carols was no greater than from one stanchel of the window to another and over against the carols against the church wall did stand certain great almaries or cupboards of wainscot all full of books with great store of ancient manuscripts to help them in their study wherein did lie as well the old ancient written doctors of the church as other profane authors with divers other holy men's works so that every one did study what doctor pleased them best having the library at all times to go study in besides their carols no example of an english monastic book press has survived so far as i have been able to discover but it would be rash to say that none exists meanwhile i will shew you a french example of a press from the sacristy of the cathedral at bayeux but i cannot be sure that it was originally intended to hold books monsieur violet le duc from whom i borrowed it decides it was probably made early in the thirteenth century the durham rites speak only of book presses standing in the cloister against the walls but it was not unusual to have recesses in the wall itself fitted with shelves and probably closed by a door two such are to be seen at worcester immediately to the north of the chapter house door each is about ten feet wide by two feet deep a similar receptacle for books seems to have been contemplated in augustinian houses for in the customs of the augustinian priory of barnwell written towards the end of the thirteenth century the following passage occurs the press in which the books are kept ought to be lined inside with wood that the damp of the walls may not moisten or stain the books this press should be divided vertically as well as horizontally by sundry partitions on which the books may be ranged so as to be separated from one another for fear they be packed so close as to injure each other or delay those who want them recesses such as these were developed in cistercian houses into a small square room without a window and but little larger than an ordinary cupboard in the plans of clairvaux and kirkstall this room is placed between the chapter house and the transept of the church and similar rooms in similar situations have been found at fountains beaulieu tintern netley etc the catalogue made thirteen ninety six of the cistercian abbey at moo in holderness now totally destroyed gives us a glimpse of the internal arrangement of one of these rooms the books were placed on shelves against the walls and even over the door again the catalogue of the house of white cannons at titchfield in hampshire dated fourteen hundred shows that the books were kept in a small room on shelves there called columpne set against the walls 
it is obvious that no study could have gone forward in such places as these they must have been intended for security only and to replace the wooden presses used elsewhere as time went on the number of books would naturally increase and by the beginning of the fifteenth century the larger monasteries at least had accumulated many hundred volumes for instance at christ church canterbury at the beginning of the fourteenth century there were six hundred and ninety eight these had to be bestowed in various parts of the house without order or selection in presses set up wherever a vacant corner could be found to the great inconvenience we may be sure of the more studious monks or of scholars who came to consult them to remedy such a state of things a definite room was constructed for books in addition to the presses in the cloister which were still retained for the books in daily use a few instances of this will suffice at christchurch canterbury a library was built between fourteen fourteen and fourteen forty three by archbishop Schickel over the prior's chapel at durham between fourteen sixteen and fourteen forty six by prior wessington over the old sacristy at situ in fourteen eighty over the writing room scriptorium at clairvaux between fourteen ninety five and fifteen o three in the same position at saint victor in paris an augustinian house between fifteen o one and fifteen o eight and at saint germain des prés in the same city about fifteen thirteen over the south cloister most of us i take it have more or less imperfect ideas of the appearance of a great monastery in the days of its completeness and information on this point is unfortunately much more defective for our own country than it is for france in illustration therefore of what i have been saying about the position of monastic libraries i will next show you two bird's-eye views of the benedictine house of saint germain de prés paris the first dated sixteen eighty seven shows the library over the south walk of the cloister where it was placed in fifteen thirteen it must not however be supposed that no library existed before this on the contrary the house seems to have had one from the first foundation and so early as the thirteenth century it could be consulted by strangers and books borrowed from it the second view dated seventeen twenty three shows a still further extension of the library it has now invaded the west side of the cloister which has received an upper story and even the external appearance of the venerable refectory which was respected when nearly all the rest of the buildings were rebuilt in a classical style has been sacrificed to a similar gallery the united lengths of these three rooms must have been a little short of three hundred and twenty-four feet this library was at the disposal of all scholars who desired to use it when the revolution came it contained more than forty nine thousand printed books and seven thousand manuscripts the fittings belong to the period of its latest extension they appear to have been sumptuous but for my present object uninteresting at canterbury the library built as i have said over the prior's chapel was sixty feet long by twenty two feet broad and we know from some memoranda written in fifteen o eight when a number of books were sent to be bound or repaired that it contained sixteen bookcases each of which had four shelves i have calculated that this library could have contained about two thousand volumes i have shown you a benedictine house and will next show you a bird's-eye view of situ the parent house of the cistercian order founded at the close of the eleventh century the original was taken so far as i can make out about fifteen hundred at any rate before the primitive buildings had been seriously altered the library here occupied two positions under the roof between the dormitory and the refectory which must have been extremely inconvenient and subsequently it was rebuilt in an isolated situation on the north side of the second cloister over the writing room scriptorium this was also the position of the new library at clairvaux the other great cistercian house in france the fame of which was equal to if not greater than that of Situ. of this latter library we have two descriptions the first written in fifteen seventeen the second in seventeen twenty three the former account by the secretary of the queen of sicily who visited clairvaux thirteen july fifteen seventeen is as follows on the same side of the cloister are fourteen studies 
where the monks write and study and over the said studies is the new library to which one mounts by a broad and lofty spiral staircase from the aforesaid cloister the library is one hundred and eighty nine feet long by seventeen feet wide in it are forty eight seats bonfs, and in each seat four shelves pulpitra, furnished with books on all subjects but chiefly theology the greater number of the said books are of vellum and written by hand richly storied and illuminated the building that contains the said library is magnificent built of stone and exceedingly lighted on both sides with fine large windows well glazed looking out on the said cloister and the burial ground of the brethren the said library is paved throughout with small tiles adorned with various designs the description written in seventeen twenty three by the learned benedictines to whom we owe the voyage littéraire is equally interesting from the great cloister you proceed into the cloister of conversation so called because the brethren are allowed to converse there in this cloister there are twelve or fifteen little cells all of a row where the brethren formerly used to write books for this reason they are still called at the present day the writing rooms over these cells is the library the building for which is large vaulted well lighted and stocked with a large number of manuscripts fastened by chains to desks but there are not many printed books in the great cloister on the side next the chapter house the same observer noted books chained on wooden desks which the brethren can come and read when they please the library was for serious study the cloister for daily reading probably in the main devotional if my time were unlimited i could describe to you several other fifteenth century monastic libraries but i feel that i must content myself with only one more that of the franciscan house in london commonly called christ's hospital the first stone of this library was laid by sir richard whittington twenty one october fourteen twenty one and by christmas day in the following year the roof was finished stowe tells us that it was one hundred twenty nine feet long by thirty one feet broad and the letters patent of henry the eighth add that it had twenty eight desks and twenty eight double settles of wainscot the whole building so well worth preservation has been totally destroyed but i am able to shew you a view of it this view is an excellent illustration of the point on which i have insisted namely that in the course of the fifteenth century the great religious houses no matter to what order they belonged found that their books had become too numerous for the localities primitively intended for them and began to build special libraries usually over some existing structure or in other words established a library of reference which was not unfrequently thrown open to scholars in general who were allowed to borrow books from it on execution of an indenture or deposit of a sufficient pledge it is safer to fall back on a pledge than to proceed against an individual said the customs of the priory at abingdon in what way were these monastic libraries fitted up no trace of any monastic fittings has survived so far as i am aware either in england or in france or in italy and even m violet le doux dismisses the library in a few brief sentences of which the keynote is despair my own view is that a close analogy may be traced between the fittings of monastic libraries and those of collegiate libraries and that when we understand the one we shall understand the other the collegiate system was in no sense of the word monastic indeed it was to a certain extent established to counteract monastic influence but it is absurd to suppose that the younger communities would borrow nothing from the elder especially when we reflect that the monastic system had completed at least seven centuries of successful existence before walter de merton was moved to found a college that many of the subsequent founders of colleges were churchmen if not actually monks and that there were monastic colleges at both universities further as we have seen that study was specially enjoined upon the monks by saint benedict it is precisely in the direction of study that we should expect to find common features in the two sets of communities and this in fact is what came to pass an examination of the statutes affecting the library in the codes imposed upon colleges of oxford and cambridge shows that their provisions were borrowed directly from the monastic customs the resemblances are too striking to be accidental 
take for instance this clause from the statutes of oriel college oxford dated thirteen twenty nine the common books communis libri of the house are to be brought out and inspected once a year on the feast of the commemoration of souls second november in presence of the provost or his deputy and of the scholars fellows every one of them in turn in order of seniority may select a single book which either treats of the science to which he is devoting himself or which he requires for his use this he may keep until the same festival in the succeeding year when a similar selection of books is to take place and so on from year to year if there should happen to be more books than persons those that remain are to be selected in the same manner bishop bateman who had been educated in the priory at norwich and whose brother was an abbot gave statutes to trinity hall cambridge in thirteen fifty with similar provisions and the addition that certain books are to remain continuously in the library chamber fastened with iron chains for the common use of the fellows these were copied by wycombe at new college oxford but with extended provisions for lending books to students and a direction that all the books which remain unassigned after the fellows have made their selection are to be fastened with iron chains and remain for ever in the common library this statute was repeated at king's college cambridge and several other colleges in oxford let me now remind you of archbishop lanfranc's statute for english benedictines dated ten seventy which was based as he himself tells us on the general monastic practice of his time on monday after the first sunday in lent before the brethren come into the chapter house the librarian custos librorum shall have a carpet laid down and all the books got together upon it except those which a year previously had been assigned for reading these brethren are to bring with them when they come into the chapter house each his book in his hand then the librarian shall read a statement as to the manner in which brethren have had books during the past year as each brother hears his name pronounced he is to give back the book which had been entrusted to him for reading and he whose conscience accuses him of not having read the book through which he had received is to fall on his face confess his fault and entreat forgiveness the librarian shall then make a fresh distribution of books namely a different volume to each brother for his reading you will agree with me i feel sure that this statute or similar provisions extracted from other regulations is the source of the collegiate provisions for an annual audit and distribution of books while the reservation of the undistributed volumes and their chaining for common use in a library was in accordance with the unwritten practice of the monasteries this being the case i think that we are justified in assuming that the internal fittings of the libraries would be identical also and it must be further remembered that both collegiate and monastic libraries were being fitted up during the same period the fifteenth century when books were first placed in a separate room fastened with iron chains for the use of the fellows of a college or the monks of a convent the piece of furniture used was i take it an elongated lectern or desk of a convenient height for a seated reader to use the books lay on their sides on the desk and were attached by chains to a horizontal bar above it there were at least two libraries in this university fitted with such desks at the colleges of pembroke and queens and that it was a common form abroad is proved by its appearance in a french translation of the first book of the consolations of philosophy of bothius which i lately found in the british museum executed towards the end of the fifteenth century one example at least of these fittings still exists in the library attached to the church of st walburg at zutphen in holland this library was built in its present position in fifteen fifty five but i suspect that some of the fittings those namely which are more richly ornamented were removed from an earlier library each of these desks is nine feet long by five feet six inches high and as you will see directly a man can sit and read at them very conveniently i shall show you first a general view of part of the library and secondly a single desk such cases as these must have been used at the sorbonne where a library was first established in twelve eighty nine for books chained for the common convenience of the fellows in communum sociorum utilitatum a description of this library based probably on records now lost has been given by claude hemera librarian sixteen thirty eight to sixteen forty three in his manuscript history this i proceed to translate 
the old library was contained under one roof it was firmly and solidly built and was one hundred twenty feet long by thirty-six feet broad further that it might be the more safe from the danger of being burnt should any house in the neighborhood catch fire there was a sufficient interval between it and every dwelling house each side was pierced with nineteen windows of equal size that plenty of daylight both from the east and the west for this was the direction of the room might fall upon the desks and fill the whole length and breadth of the library there were twenty-eight desks marked with the letters of the alphabet five feet high and so arranged that they were separated by a moderate interval they were loaded with books all of which were chained that no sacrilegious hand might carry them off these chains were attached to the right-hand board of every book so that they might be readily thrown aside and reading not be interfered with moreover the volumes could be opened and shut without difficulty a reader who sat down in the space between two desks as they rose to a height of five feet as i said above neither saw nor disturbed any one else who might be reading or writing in another place by talking or by any other interruption unless the other student wished it or paid attention to any question that might be put to him it was required by the ancient rules of the library that reading writing and handling of books should go forward in complete silence this system must have been very wasteful as regards space for only a few volumes say a couple of dozen could be accommodated on a single desk as books accumulated therefore some other form of case had to be devised which would accommodate more volumes than could be consulted at once the desk could not be dispensed with so long as books were chained but one or more shelves were added to it this addition was effected in two ways according as the books were to stand on their ends or to lie on their sides as an illustration of the former plan i will take the library of merton college oxford attributed by tradition to william reed bishop of chichester thirteen sixty eight to eighty five and it has been so little altered that it may be taken as a type of medieval collegiate or monastic library it is a long narrow room as all medieval libraries were with equidistant windows and the bookcases stand at right angles to the walls in the spaces between each pair of windows in front of which is the seat for the reader each bookcase had originally two shelves only above the desk i will show you first a general view of the interior of this library and then a single bookcase and seat the system of chaining as adopted in this country would allow of the books being readily taken down from the shelves and laid on the desk for reading one end of the chain was attached to the middle of the upper edge of the right hand board the other to a ring which played on a bar set in front of the shelf on which the book stood the fore edge of the books not the back was turned forwards a swivel usually in the middle of the chain prevented tangling the chains varied in length according to the distance of the shelf from the desk the bar was kept in place by a rather elaborate system of ironwork attached to the end of the bookcase and secured by a lock which often required two keys that is the presence of two officials to open it to illustrate this i will show you a sketch of one of the bookcases in hereford cathedral having said thus much about chaining i return to the merton bookcases cases similar to these were evidently in use in the library of christ church canterbury where the memoranda i mentioned record four shelves that is two on each side in each bookcase and also of clairvaux where a similar feature was observed the design was evidently much admired for we find cases of a similar plan but larger elsewhere in oxford as at the college of corpus christi st john's trinity jesus and in the bodleian library another device for combining desk with shelf is to be seen at trinity hall cambridge and as these cases were set up after sixteen twenty six we have here a curious instance of a deliberate return to ancient forms there is evidence that there once existed below the shelf a second desk which could be drawn in and out as required so that a reader could stand or sit as he pleased as you will see from the next illustration the university of leiden in holland adopted a modification of this design for there the shelf is above the desk and readers could only stand to use the books an arrangement analogous to this was adopted at situ as we may gather from the catalogue drawn up in fourteen eighty 
i will not trouble you with details but merely say that there was evidently a shelf below the desk as well as one above it the cases therefore resembled those at leyden with this difference and they were also probably of such a height that the reader could conveniently sit at them on the continent where elaborate bindings came early into fashion sometimes protected by equally elaborate bosses at their corners it would have been impossible to arrange the volumes as we did side by side on the shelves it therefore became the fashion to place a shelf below the desk and to lay the books upon it on their sides the earliest library fitted in this manner that i have been able to discover is at cesena in northern italy it was built in fourteen fifty two by domenico malatesta novello for the convent of san francesco it is possible therefore that the parent house of san francisco at assisi which had a large library divided so early as thirteen eighty one into a libreria publica and a libreria secreta had similar bookcases i am going to show you a general view of the room which has a thoroughly medieval character next the cases and thirdly a single book with its chain you will observe that the seats for the reader are no longer independent but are combined with the bookcase these cases no doubt suggest those in the medician library at florence begun in fifteen twenty five by michelangelo the cases perhaps the finest specimens in existence of wood carving as applied to this style of work were designed by other artists shortly after the completion of the room in english libraries at least bookcases arranged on what i may term the oxford type were in general use throughout the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries the invention of printing had largely increased the number of volumes and at the same time diminished their value so that chaining was no longer necessary when it had been abandoned neither a desk nor a seat in close proximity to the books was required in consequence though libraries continued to be built on the ancient type with numerous windows close to the floor it was possible to alter the old cases or to make new ones with a far larger number of shelves than heretofore and when further space for books was needed low cases were interposed between each pair of tall ones a splendid specimen of this treatment is to be seen at st john's college cambridge where the bookcases were put up soon after the completion of the library in sixteen twenty eight though the plinth and central pilaster have been taken away and the levels of the shelves changed their original appearance can be recovered at a glance on the top of all the low cases there was a desk in the memory of that of ancient times at the end of the taller cases is a panel to contain the catalogue here closed by a small door sometimes as we see at peterhouse ancient usage asserts itself so far that a seat was contrived by making the plinth of the tall case project to a sufficient distance these bookcases were set up between sixteen forty one and sixteen forty eight when the necessity for still further space for books became imperative the seat was given up or was dropped to the height of a step as in the bookcases in the south room of the university library cambridge put up soon after sixteen forty nine the carved wing however which had massed the ends of it was retained as an ornament both there and in the old library at pembroke college cambridge furnished soon after sixteen ninety meanwhile a new system of arranging bookcases had come into use on the continent so far as i have been able to discover the first library arranged in the way with which we are familiar namely with the bookcases set against the walls instead of at right angles to them is that of the escurial these cases were made by herrera the architect of the building in fifteen eighty four there is no indication of chaining but in conformity with ancient usage the fore edge of the books instead of their backs is turned outwards and the desk is represented by a shelf carried all round the room at a convenient height no doubt so important a structure as this erected by so mighty a potentate as the king of spain would be much talked about and provoke imitators among these i feel sure was cardinal mazarin whose library was fitted up in paris in or about sixteen forty seven as a library to be used daily by the public after his death his books and bookcases were moved to the building in which they may still be seen i will now show you views of the two libraries that you shall decide whether it is not obvious that one was suggested by the other the new system was not accepted hastily i believe that sir christopher wren when he built trinity college library in sixteen ninety five 
was the first english architect who ventured to build a library with windows which as he says himself rise high and give place for the desks against the walls i suspect he borrowed this latter idea from france which he visited in sixteen sixty five and most likely from the bibliothèque mazarina for he himself recorded his admiration for the masculine furniture of the palais mazarin though he does not especially mention the library but he did not discard the ancient arrangement altogether on the contrary he utilized it so far as to subdivide the room and provide recesses for the convenience of students he says the disposition of the shelves both along the walls and breaking out from the walls must needs provide very convenient and graceful and the best way for the students will be to have a little square table in each cell with two chairs the necessity of bringing windows and doors to answer to the old building leaves two squarer places at the ends and four lesser cells not to study in but to be shut up with some neat lattice doors for archives i need hardly say that neither this library nor any of those built by wren's pupils or imitators shew traces of chaining the old fashion however lingered in sixteen fifty one humphrey cheatham directed the books he gave to certain specified parish churches near manchester to be chained in sixteen ninety four james lever gave books to a grammar school at bolton in lancashire which were chained in a cupboard very like the amarium of a monastic cloister and at all saints church hereford a collection of books bequeathed in seventeen fifteen was chained to ordinary shelves set against the walls as may still be seen this very obvious way of disposing of books evidently shocked old-fashioned people for cole the antiquary writing in seventeen o three could still speak of the arrangement of shelves against the walls as a la moderna the libraries i have been describing were more or less public and i should like before i conclude to show you how books were bestowed in the studies of individual scholars whether royal monastic or secular i conceive that for many centuries after the beginning of the christian era the methods of the ancient world were followed and that private libraries were arranged upon the roman model in presses with busts mottoes and the like such was the library of isidore bishop of Sevilla, six o one to six thirty six he was a voluminous writer and seems to have had a voluminous library divided if i interpret the arrangements correctly among fourteen presses each ornamented by one or more portrait busts or medallions with suitable verses beneath them the series concludes with a notice ad intervertorem a person whom we may call a talkative intruder non patitor quenquam coram se scriba loquentum non est hi quod agus garula perge foras how useful such an admonition would be in modern libraries if only it could be enforced so late as the end of the twelfth century i find a bishop who bequeathed his library to a church describing it as the contents of my press plenarium amarium meum gradually however other methods came into fashion due probably to the introduction of handsome bindings of which i have already spoken some particulars have fortunately been preserved of the cost of fitting up a certain tower in the louvre between thirteen sixty four and thirteen sixty eight to contain the books belonging to charles v of france from which much useful information may be extracted the fittings of the older library in the palace on the ile de la cite were to be taken down and altered and set up in the new room two carpenters are paid for having taken to pieces all the cases banc, and two wheels roll that is revolving desks which were in the king's library in the palace and transported them to the louvre and for having put all together again and hung up the cases letron in the two upper stages of the tower that looks toward the falconry to put the king's books in and for having panelled the first of those two stories all round inside next a wire worker cajatier is paid for having made trellises of wire in front of two casements and two windows to keep out birds and other beasts oiseaux et autres bestes by reason of and protection for the books that shall be placed there the words banque and latran which i have translated cases are both frequently used the first commonly denotes the cases in monastic libraries and the second is the usual word for a reading desk 
i think therefore that the two words were applied to describe the same piece of furniture as stall and desk were with us i am now going to show you two pictures of rooms arranged for study which fit the above description very well the first is from a french translation of boccaccio de care malero noble home et femme written and illuminated in flanders for king henry the seventh two gentlemen are studying a revolving desk which can be raised or lowered by a screw this is evidently the wheel of the french king's library behind are their books either resting on a desk hung against the wall which is panelled or lying on a shelf beneath the desk the second is also flemish of the same date from a copy of the mayor historial it represents a monk probably the author of the book writing in his study behind him are three desks one above the other hung against the wall with books as in the first picture resting upon them some such arrangement as this must have been long in fashion libraries such as those of dion de portier and francis i could not have been bestowed in any other way and in fact when books are enriched with metalwork or have specially elaborate ornaments on their sides a desk of some sort is indispensable humbler scholars had to content themselves with small cupboards constructed in the thickness of the wall or hung against it as in the pictures i will next show you from a french translation of valerius maximus copied for king edward the fourth and dated fourteen seventy nine you will observe that the lower part of the window is fitted with trellises as in the french king's library not casements the upper part only is glazed another and apparently very usual way of bestowing books especially when they were not numerous was to place them in a sort of cupboard under the sloping desk on which the owner read or wrote an excellent specimen of this device which richard de bury specially commends as being modelled on the ark in the side of which the book of law was put is to be found in the ship of fools fourteen ninety eight another of a curiously modern type occurs in the hours in the fitzwilliam museum cambridge executed about fourteen forty five for isabel duchess of brittany sometimes this book covered supported a revolving desk which could be raised or depressed by the help of a central screw like those i showed you just now sometimes the desk alone appears with books laid on it the forms given to these pieces of furniture by the ingenuity of those who made them are infinite and they often include beautiful designs for armchairs fitted with desks for writing i will show you just one not because it is specially beautiful but because it gives a quaint picture of a scholar's room at the beginning of the fifteenth century here time as represented by yonder clock holds up his finger and bids me stop i would fain have shown you more pictures but i hope that you have seen a sufficient number to give you some idea of the surroundings in which our forefathers read and wrote i am sure that only in this way can we realize that they were real living people not mere names their modes of thought were far different from ours they may have wasted their time in verbal subtleties and uncritical tales but the more we study what they did the more we shall realize how laborious how artistic how conscientious they were and amid all the developments of the nineteenth century we shall gratefully confess that the middle ages rock the cradle of our knowledge and that we see but their hope become reality End of section 10